Welcome to Blind Owl Bushcraft and Survival. Hi, welcome to Blind Owl Bushcraft and Survival. My name's Dan. Here in the Philippines. Just went outside to the old rock shop. Put the more Garberg on the buffer with some green con compound. Maybe 30 seconds at the most. Same with the more black. I just cleaned them up with the sandpaper and some oil a little while ago. So they're both shaving sharp, just, just like that. Shave the hair off my leg. I uh, found these, found this blank knife here. This is one of those little mini cleavers that I made before. Blades just paper thin here. I put rust converter on these probably a year and a half ago and hung them up on the wall. I haven't really noticed them for a long time ago. Maybe I'll uh, grind this down again and put a handle on this one. And then a kind of a hunting style knife, kind of like a clip point or a buoy knife. Uh, got it at a knife table probably 10 years ago. Never put a handle on it. They don't like making them full tang here. But this is has a little lanyard loop bent over for it. But they're pretty nice steel. Again, this is another thing here. This has the um, chisel edge. It has the edge on only one side. It has the edge on the right side. It's a right-handed knife. And uh, so I'll, I'll clean these up. I got to find some wood for a handle. I don't know what I'll use for that, but maybe that'll be my project next week or something. This one's actually got the maker's uh, name stamped in it, which is real nice, which usually tells you that it's probably molly steel, they call it, which is spring steel. Um, but when you get these thinner knives, it's hit and miss whether it is or not. It doesn't really make any difference, but we're just using them for work knives anyway. We don't need anything fancy, but the spring steel is so much better. You know, it's got a nice shape to the blade. Got a little bit of a clip clip point there. But it, it'll make a nice a nice hunting knife. The, the last one that I had, I used, I, that's the one I put the bone handle on. And it'd be nice if I could find a nice big piece of beef bone somewhere, like a nice six or seven inch piece that would fit my hand. Uh, that would be really nice. Maybe I'll ask uh, at the market next time I go there if anybody's got any bones laying around. The one for the bone handle I found out in the woods. Pork bones might work just as good too, I have no idea. But I know the beef bones are usually pretty good size. So I gotta stay on top of these knives a little bit more. I, I let the more black get pretty rusty. I should be ashamed of that. That really sucks. It's not bad. I mean, I gotta clean it up. Well, it took a second to clean it up, but shouldn't knife shouldn't get that way. Just have so many so many knives that don't get around them all the time. And then the more black, it was just more black was rusty right on the edge. The very the very edge of it was was rusty. And again, I put the sandpaper on it. 220 sandpaper on the edge. Got rid of all the the rust that I could see. Took it out, put it on the cloth wheel on the buffer with some green compound. Probably, let's see, four four passes on each side. A little more compound. Two passes lighter. Touch more compound. One really light pass on both sides. And it's absolutely shaving sharp from here all the way to the tip. I always check the flat spot, but I always like to have the curved part of the blade. What's, what's the curved part of the blade called? Does that have a special name? I don't even know, guys out there for the knife guys um, but I, I want it all sharp I want it all razor shaving sharp is what I want it for I'm not going to shave with it but I want my knife sharp and then again this has a real nice dangler sheath for it the more Garberg and again thanks so much to John up in Minnesota for it we're gonna get real lucky this year guys we're gonna get we're gonna get to meet John John's coming to the Philippines uh, we're not sure when. He was planning on coming in May, but I think he he's, might be changing to July now or something. We're not quite sure yet. 
but eventually we'll see him, and uh, that'll be quite a treat to meet to meet John in person. I talk to him all the time on video calls and stuff like that. Here's the fake old hickory knife from Amazon. No markings on it whatsoever. Sold as an old hickory knife. It has no Ontario marks on it whatsoever. It's about one third of the size of my of my regular old hickory that I have. But again, from the picture, you can't see that. And again, they're Amazon and all these places, eBay and stuff. They're just famous for you know putting in bogus bogus blades. They have no conscience whatsoever on it. It's a nice knife. I'm not going to say anything bad about it. It's a nice enough knife. It's pretty thin. Be a good kitchen knife. I I, I bought it to, to use as a piggyback knife on one of my uh, bolos, but I never got around to it. I have my regular Ontario old hickory is on my 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 big bolo parang. these Philippine knives are okay. The other one that I have like this that I made that I put a handle on it I used the wood from a crate from a, a vegetable crate and made a nice little handle for it and it's just wicked because it's it I, I love the the flat straight blade the cleaver style of it but it's almost I'd say maybe a half the thickness of a piece of paper on the edge and the other one is, and it's just like it, it's it's not doesn't have a what is a what is a uh, a barber's razor has doesn't that have a a convex edge on it I think something like that doesn't have that on it but it's so thin it's uh, beyond sharp again the other bad thing about these knives here is they rust like crazy so. You really got to stay on top of them. And these are the ones here, as soon as you get them polished down to um, silver, that's when, especially if they don't have a handle on it, that's when you put a really good patina on, either a vinegar patina, a black rust patina, or a, maybe a banana patina. And then put the handle on, so it's got a nice patina underneath the handle. That, that'll last forever. And... The rest of it will be very nice. But again, you still have to boil like crazy, even with the patina on. Another thing you can use also is blue. I used the Casey's, the Casey's Blue on my USMC knife when I uh, redid that knife back about, that was probably more than 10 years ago now. I put 16 coats of blue on it after I got it all back shiny and shaving sharp. And that was a beautiful knife for a while. And again, I thought I thought that was enough to keep it from rusting, but it didn't. It rusted like crazy. So I had to sand it down again and put the blue back on it again and then keep it oiled up. So again, everything everything I do here is a learning process. And learning from my mistakes, trial and error stuff, and finding different ways to do different things. I might put a, maybe a, I might put a ferric, was it ferric chloride? Is that the right right word? I can't remember. Uh, I got this ferric stuff that they use for uh, circuit boards and stuff. Uh, a guy from Europe told me about it. That makes another nice patina too. Sometimes it's kind of a yellowish patina it puts on, a kind of a goldish patina depending on the steel. Remember that knife I had, the, my Moonshiner clone? I put that on there and that was kind of a weird, I think that was a weird off stainless steel type blade and that had a really funny colored patina on it but again it was nice another converted knife but I guess I got I got something to play with now I also need to make a couple more alcohol stoves I've got this one can of Fanta here I want to keep one can of Fanta, an empty can. I'm going to use this for my alcohol storage when I go. I can, put a, I can put the lid down nice and tight on it, and I'll fill that full of alcohol, and that's what I'll take with me when I go camping or something like that. 
but I also have two cans of peach Fanta up in the refrigerator that my daughter drank. I don't know why the cans are still in the refrigerator, they're empty, but they're there. It's a good place for them though, they don't get dented up or anything like that. But I want to make, I think I'll make two more stoves out of those, and then I'll give away the my first Fanta aluminum stove to somebody, and I'll make one for myself, and maybe one for my wife, one for my daughter's bag. Because I really like this style, using this solid neck here. And if you go go look at James' channel at Harshman Hills, um, he has been making some really nice alcohol stoves and some different style ones. He found a, a, a metal can back home that had a neck on it, had a stubby little neck on it. He made a beautiful stove out of that. And he's got a couple other styles that had holes. He had one stove that had holes real low on it. That was really nice. I tried to duplicate that. I had no luck with that one yet, but I'm doing something wrong on it. And the other thing I did here was I folded the top over and the edge, which is fantastic. So now there's no there's no sharp edge on the top of here for the aluminum cans where they go together either. That's also fantastic. This one here, my first try has too many holes in it. My next hole, this has 30, this has 29 holes in it. My next one will have, um, I think, 16 holes is what I'm shooting for, I think, is what I want. And I think that would be much better. I might make one with 16 holes, and I might make one with four holes or, or eight holes. The four hole ones are really nice too, because then it, it's only have, you only have four flames coming out. Much better for doing stuff like uh, frying eggs and stuff like that. It's not so hot, but you want at least 16 holes when you're trying to boil water and stuff. It makes a huge difference. And 32 holes. This this boil this boiled uh, 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 six a six inch sauce saucepan three fourths of the way full. Boiled the water in that in under five minutes. So, but it it it, sh it used up the fuel really quick too because again it was so many holes. And of course, I'm all over the place on my talk here again. I'm just going to say it. I sharpened my knives up, which I did, which is fantastic. As I'm standing here, I show you again. I got my titanium pot that our friend Chris gave us from Boston. Thank you so much, Chris. Chris also gave me a beautiful stove with the neck inside of it made out of one of those stadium bottles, the, the, the Bud stadium bottles. They're made out of a little thicker aluminum. Made a beautiful, beautiful stove. And they're not, quite as, they're not quite as big around as a normal can, but strong, super strong. He rolled over the top edge on his, and that's, what, that's why I tried it on this one. I did this one by, my, by hand. I'm sure he had to do something fancy to get his rolled over. But, but he just gave me this titanium pan pot. First time I've ever had a pot like this. It also has the handles on it so that it's a cup, has a bale on it, has a lid on it, has the little holes in the lid for steam. It's just so cool. Now this one won't work so good on a stove like this because most of the heat will come out around the side. It'll still work. Uh, but it worked much better with the one he made. Is like I say, it's just a, a half inch smaller diameter than this one is. So the more of the flames are are underneath the, the pot itself. There goes the cuckoo clock. I don't know if you hear that in the background or not. But I'm really I'm really impressed with this titanium pot because I've never had anything like this before. He says it's lighter than aluminum and stronger than steel which is so cool. It has no... I buy a pot like this here in the Philippines, you can just crush them with your hand. This one here is solid, solid as can be. This is this is going to be the main part of my uh, cooking set. I think I'm going to trade trade this in for my Stanley cook set, which has a, but maybe about the same diameter as this, but it's a little taller pot, which is also another nice nice pot, also quite a bit heavier. But I think I think this belongs in my. Meg, uh, okay, Meg, I, I will put this in my, um, the bag that I, I take when I go out on hikes and stuff like that. My EDC bag. I'll put this in there so I have something to this and then when I want to go, I know I'm going to go for a whole day or whatever. I'll just throw a 
a can of chicken and rice soup in there or something like that and a bag of rice, maybe a hot dog in there or something like that and then take it out and make lunch. We should, this would be absolutely perfect for that. And just have it so I can throw it in my bug out bag if I need it. This is a perfect, perfect pot though. All right, that's all I got, I guess. I've been rambling on here again for another... It turns out to be about eight or 10 minutes, no matter what I do. Um, what else do I got here that I can just grab real quick and show you? Not too much. I don't know if you guys have ever tied your your paracord up. This is a this is a paracord donut, and all it is is a a loop knot, like a daisy chain knot, where you just you just pull it out like this, and then ne the next knot ch -ch 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 just keeps pulling out and out and out and out. Um, it puts a little bit of wrinkle on the the cord because you got a little knot all the way around it but you run your fingers over it a couple times this is this is like 30 feet of cord this little bitty little bitty donut pretty pretty nice way to carry your cordage again I might my favorite way to carry cordage is what I call a fast rope and these are quick release fast ropes they've got a little loop on the top and a, a cord in the bottom pull the top string off pull the bottom string out and it'll just peel this one this is 25 feet of of uh number 18 uh cord like mason's cord i like it because it's bright pink and i i brought this with me in 2004 when i came here and i just finally getting around to using it but i really like it because it's bright and you'll be able to see it during the day and i i would use this mainly for the corners of my tarp and things like that so you can actually see it. I think another color would even be better would be the bright green. It would be even a better color, the chartreuse color. I think that's what you call that. But absolutely fantastic for that. I also have some thinner um, paracord. I don't, I don't think you call it 550 cord, like 350 paracord. I have some of that that's glow in the dark and it's kind of a white color. That has actually be nice for your. Um, Tarps and stuff like that, so you can see the see the cores. I also Chris Chris from Boston also gave me a, quite a while ago. He gave me a, a nice big hank of um, real light paracord, like if you, maybe you'd call it 220 paracord or something like that, and it's reflective reflective paracord, so you see it with your flashlight at night. Really nice, really really nice. But there's all different kinds of stuff. Tons of different ways. Again, you might have saw my video. I just put some videos up not too long ago about the fast ropes. I did one video of the fast rope with this, and I did one video of fast rope with paracord, just to just to kind of try to drive it into some of your guys' heads. If you want to store your cordage in your packs and stuff, use a fast rope. You'll never have a tangled rope ever again in your life. And your cords will all be right there, ready to go. Because again, I put mine in a, um, I have a dry sack, a couple little dry sacks that I have. I have a dry sack full of paracord. And then on the, the, on the top of the pack inside, I have my tarp that's folded up. And on top of the tarp is my dry sack with paracord in it. So that if I ever need to make a shelter, stop somewhere for emergency quick, whatever, my shelter is always on top, ready to go. And again, I don't usually put a, a tarp up with a ridge line for like a, a storm. I would make my my little, if you've seen some of my videos, I, I make a, a really cool five minute shelter that's fantastic for that, for just for bad rains and, and storms. Um, if I was gonna make a, a camp, of course I would use a ridge line and I would use, again, then I would use this stuff on the corners of my tarp in the center of my tarp to hold it down and then I would also have a, a here of course I would have a jungle hammock with the mosquito net on it which I, I would have the same thing back home too in Iowa or wherever I was at because there's always bugs and I, I don't like bugs at all um, and then for the ridge line paracord is fine enough for the ridge line for your tarp that's no problem at all And then I use, for my hammocks, I use straps, tree straps, which are fantastic also. 
Uh, another thing you can use is uh, nylon straps that aren't don't have the tree tree straps have loops in it that you can go through for tightening it down for adjustable lengths and stuff like that it makes it kind of fancy. But uh, I also use just regular nylon straps. I think they're I'd say they're probably three quarters of an inch to an inch wide, but pretty thin, and they work very good. Uh, I found the secret to those though, and again, I'm just rambling on here guys, the secret to the nylon straps is to get a big like a spaghetti pot with boiling water and then boil your straps. And I also, other thing I like to do, I like to boil my paracord too. I boil my paracord and uh, then let it dry and that shrinks it up just a little bit because a lot of times when you use stuff for the first or second time, uh, some of your straps, and if you try to use a pair couple couple layers of paracord for your um, hammock you'll find your butt on the ground in the middle you know in the middle of the night or the morning because that stuff because the unless you have really good paracord like uh, uh, you know real real quality paracord military grade paracord this cheap stuff here like this now this has this this has the seven strands and it actually has seven nice strands in it this is regular Chinese paracord that I bought here in the Philippines this isn't bad, but it still only has a, a load load bearing weight of I would say about 100 pounds tops. So if I was going to use this for my hammock, I would for sure at least use two pieces to make it strong enough. Maybe even three pieces, and then figure the first the first day you use it, it's going to stretch like crazy. So just something to think about. That's why you always test your gear out in your yard. Make sure you put your tent up bunch of times in the yard put your hammock up a bunch of times in the yard laying it a bunch of times laying it for a Sunday afternoon you know take a TV outside with you or something and lay in the hammock for the afternoon and see if the your strings stretch and stuff like that so that it doesn't happen to you when you're out camping and wind up getting a sore back or something like that and, uh, again where I'm at you have to be up off the ground because we have cobras and and monitor lizards and stuff like that. I don't want to be anywhere near the ground with all the ants and, and the different bugs, but the cobras are what I worry about here. And back home, back home, I wouldn't want to be on the, have my butt six inches from the ground either with the, uh, you know, bobcats running around and raccoons and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be three and a half or four foot up off the ground. I don't know about you guys, that's, that's how I am though. So take it easy, everybody. Uh, hashtag 22 day no more. Go out, have some fun. Watch your six really close. There's a nice piece of quartz, huh? Watch your six really close, of course. Know what's going on in front of you, behind you, all around you. I haven't heard of much. I haven't heard much lately in the last two or three months about things going on back home, but I bet they still are. I think the only thing